Whoa, dudes, Michelangelo here from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the original one. Yeah, and you are listening to Canned Air Podcast. It happens to be a tribute to comics and pop culture like yours truly, Cowabunga! Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Canned Air, your tribute to comics and pop culture. I am Jeremy Colley. I'm Jack Doherty. And I'm Randy Hardenbrook. Boy, do we have a special little episode here for you today. I mean, I'm just beside myself, as any of our listeners <laughs> might uh, already be aware of it. But like uh, six of us in here are all besides ourselves. <laughs> right? Uh, we... <laughs> Took me a second, but I got there. Oh, <laughs> Took me a second. But we have an awesome guest today. I, she did voices in, like, My Little Pony, the Punky Brewster cartoon, uh, the Glow Friends Christmas movie. You guys remember Glow Friends when we were kids? Yeah, I remember Vaguely, Glow yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, 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 definitely. But she is best known for being April O'Neil in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles original cartoon. We welcome Renee Jacobs to the show, and holy cow, am I excited. Am yeah. I excited? So I guess this is going to count as our uh, Thanksgiving mm-hmm. episode. There you go. I think, uh, what was it, three years ago, we had the Shredder on for Thanksgiving. Yes. Uh, Tora Masamuni, uh, Shredder from Michael Bay Films, uh, how cool that was. And uh, it was cool because we actually got to nerd out on comics with him, too, Turtle Comics. Yeah, he did. Remember that? Yep. Mm-hmm. So another, uh, if you're into this episode, that might be one to follow up with, but you don't want to miss this one because damn what a cool conversation yeah. this was but before we get to that don't forget to find us on twitter at canned air pod and on instagram at canned underscore air and if you want to support the show head over to canned where you can click on that patreon button and become a five dollar or more patron five dollars gets you access to the canned air patreon pod and there are other things that are going to be uh, coming out more shows that you can get in higher mm-hmm. tiers and merch people we're looking at merch that if you're in even a higher tier than 10 you're going to be able to get some maybe some shirts and mugs we're still mm-hmm. working out those fine details but at the very least i mean we've got a pretty hefty back catalog of episodes in there so you're definitely going to get your money's worth oh absolutely yeah, absolutely. absolutely so please check that out and uh, what am i forgetting gentlemen Uh, Check Jack and I out every Tuesday on Facebook, Twitch, and uh, YouTube as we play Jackbox and interact with players. Uh, Send us a message if you want to be a part of it. Maybe you can win something. So, yeah. Tuesday-ish, Wednesday sometime. Yeah, just depends on how we're feeling, what's going on. Just look at the Facebook. (laughs) All can be told on Facebook. Get on the Facebook. The Facebook. (laughs) That's how we know we're getting old. But uh, anything else, gentlemen? No. All right. Yeah. Let's quit flapping our gums and just get right to our interview with Renee Jacobs. Renee, I want to thank you so much for taking time uh, to join us here on the show. It is quite a pleasure to have you uh, on the show with us. Thank you. It's great to join you. I'm I'm excited. April O'Neil, guys. Yeah, April I O'Neil. I, I can. I think you're probably one of my first crushes. <laughs> oh yes, I've heard that before. <laughs> I'm sure you have. <laughs> what was it about that yellow jumpsuit? I can't tell. Oh, no. But uh, no, again, it's awesome to have you here, and uh, just very curious about you know your your initial interest in voiceover. I believe it was in the early '80s. Uh, you and your family moved to LA from Lansing, Michigan. And that's when you really start uh, pursuing the, your voiceover career. So what was, where'd that interest come from? Why did you want to get into that field? That's funny. You know, the, actually, I moved to uh, California much earlier in the in the 60s. Oh, really? Um, with my family. Yes. Um, April O'Neil came way down, way further into my career. Um, when I was a child, we lived in Lansing, Michigan, which is home of Michigan State University, go Spartans. <laughs> and um, there were classes that were given for children at Michigan State University at the time. Um, I took a veterinary class. I took uh, classes in archaeology and paleontology. And one of the classes that I took had to do with puppetry. My mother discovered me one, I don't know, Saturday morning down in the basement doing voices. She thought somebody was down in the basement with me, but it ended up, it was me. And I was doing all these different voices and um, playing to an audience of my stuffed animals on the couch. (laughs) And um, she realized 
I was good. So this class was available. The woman who gave the course was um, kind of a precursor to Romper Room and Mr. Rogers. And they, okay. you know, she was kind of a PBS kind of a Sesame Street kind of a format. Um, and she did a number of vignettes with puppets. So she taught us at the age of six years old, seven years old, how to open up the back of a stuffed animal and take out the stuffing where the mouth was and then use that as a puppet and come up with voices. Oh. So after that class, um, this woman came up to my mom and said, Renee's really good. And, you know, I teach this in classrooms and perhaps Renee would come with me and, you know, we'll teach other children how to do that. We do Saturday morning classes. So I, I did, I was seven years old. I was teaching other kids how to make puppets and how to do voices and come up with characters. And, um, and she had me on the show uh, perform as well. So that was kind of my first um, entree into, I didn't know it was called voiceover. I just liked doing voices of characters. <laughs> I called it having fun. Yeah. Yeah, I called it I called it not being lonely. <laughs> Ever get in any trouble from showing kids how to tear their toys apart? No, that's funny. <laughs> no. No, that's so funny that you say that. No, they came to the class and they were told to bring a stuffed animal that had a mouth that could open and close. You know, if you, oh, gosh, you yeah, had a stuffed it. animal that didn't just have a smile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How good I am at hard. it. <laughs> yeah. It'd be very hard to do a voice. So that's really how I kind of started. When we moved to California, I got involved in theater, which was my first passion, and um, did a lot of children's theater. So again, lots of characters and different kinds of plays and with different kinds of characters that I played. So it continued. And then in high school, I had a teacher who actually created puppets and was hired by Knott's Berry Farm, which is a local, you know, like a Disneyland a Knott's, park. You know, right. yeah, amusement park. And he did an entire show with puppets in what was then called the gypsy camp. And Knowing me, um, he asked me to do the voices. So I did all the voices for those shows. And, and then I kind of, I went off to college. I have a degree in opera and vocal performance. Oh, wow. um, nice. I have a three and a half octave range. I've sung all over the world. I sing in French, German, Italian, Hebrew, Yiddish, Russian. Wow. Um, yeah. And uh, so I, I went off into that direction. Uh, when I, I lived in New York, I lived in London. When I came back to California, I got this fabulous agent and they happened to have a voiceover department. So I was going out for commercials and on camera and I was sitting down with the owner of the um, agency and talking with him and he said, you know, we're, we're starting a voiceover department and um, do you do voiceovers? I said, well, I do voices. So he said, okay, you do voiceovers. So <laughs> that's how it started. His name was Herb Tannen, and um, we had a wonderful department. Rusi Taylor, uh -huh. you know, of Minnie Mouse fame, right. was was one of the people. There were a lot of very famous voiceover actors with Herb Tannen for quite a while. Wow. And, um, and that's how I kind of, that was in the early 80s, you know, when I, like 1985, 86, when I started voice overing in, in an official way, not in a, yeah, I can do that. I see. Kind of way. I see. So when the turtles then came along, when, when this mm -hmm. idea for this show came along with four upright walking turtles that loved pizza, <laughs> new ninjas, uh, <laughs> you know, what was your first impression of this, of these uh, characters of this show? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, we were, all told, okay, you're going to audition for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And we all went, huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, my, you know, the agent just said, just go. Well, um, most of us had never heard of it before. And there wasn't, oh my God, there wasn't the internet. Ah! <laughs> right. Dinosaur. So, you know, there wasn't any way to really go somewhere and research it. Most of us knew the director at the time was Stu Rosen, and he showed us the comic book and he said, hey, I'm going to do this um, series and um, I'll call you and come in for an audition. So that was 
all I knew about it other than the title. And when I showed up uh, to audition, Stu was there and the, and the producers and um, actually the producers weren't there. It was just Stu and the engineers and they showed me a line drawing of April. I don't think it was in color. It was just a, a line, black and white line drawing and a description, you know, she's, she was in her early twenties. She was uh, a reporter. She was feisty and kind of a take charge kind of gal. And so um, that's what I used, the look and the, the, the character description mm -hmm. and auditioned like probably hundreds of other voiceover actresses at the time hmm. auditioned for this, this part. That's how it came, came to be. Now, one thing I had read online was that, uh, you know, you said that uh, Stu Rosen had directed uh, the audition process and that initially he wasn't uh, very thrilled with your performance, but the producers were all like, man, this is <laughs> April. This is who we need. Well, apparently, that's what he told me. You know, um, Stu was, when you knew him, off set or off, you know, Mike, mm -hmm. he was a sweet guy. He was really sweet and I had that relationship with him. But when you got into the booth or in an audition situation, he could be really tough and a little on the snide, nasty side from time to time. Oh, wow. So, um, yeah, he was like this little Jekyll and Hyde guy. You know, we all have our insecurities. Sure. And Stu was really, you know, he was a, a real trailblazer. He did a show called uh, Dusty's Treehouse which was, you know, early children's television. So he was successful as a performer many years before. And you, you never know what's in somebody's mind. But I um, showed up to the first recording for the first episode and we rehearsed it. And then we took a break. And during the break, uh, Stu was a big smoker, so you know he'd always have a cigarette. <laughs> you know, Renee, I didn't want you for this part. <sighs> like, oh my God, what the hell? What and, a thing to um, say. Yeah. Yeah, nice thing to say. He says, but you know, I I played all the recordings of all the other actresses in town, and they didn't like any of them. And then I said, well, I have one more. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> and I played them your recording and they said that's April so you're April like okay what do I do with that information <laughs> <laughs> fly high on cloud nine for a little bit because how gratifying that would be to have the producers be like yes this to just hear your voice and be like this is her yeah well you know you, you as an actor you are always very insecure and you always think that somebody's you know right next to you over here in line to take your place so yeah I didn't think it of it the way you thought I got you know like freaked out but obviously I I was uh, good enough I hung on to the part and they were right I was April yeah well, yeah, were they ever? Mm, yes. And it's awesome listening to you talk because, uh, you know, your normal voice, we, I can keep hearing April right in there. Yes. Uh, but obviously it's not uh, spot on. So like what ad added inflection and method uh, did you add to your own voice to uh, bring April to life? Well, and uh, you know, you have to, she had a lot of high energy. Yeah. So, and she was a little, you know, they wanted me to picture a little lower, but I always have a high voice. So um, I think that the, the, the spunkiness and the and the on the edge of your seat, ready to get the story that, you know, uh, always ready to take off was kind of where April lived. So um, yeah, so she's more heightened, you know. Absolutely. More, more, sense she to was the so first reporter. Yeah. She, yeah, she was the first human a uh, character that I ever played. Until then, I'd always played fairies and and dogs and cats and uh, creatures um, from fantasy, you know, fantastical, you know, flowers and things like that. Right. So April was a. It was not. It was interesting that I was able to actually use kind of who I am and what I would probably be like if I were on camera being a, a reporter. 
And it just shows through in so many volumes, that performance on, on that cartoon, because, and it really set a standard for what April was to become. I mean, uh, up until even today, you yeah. know, that's the standard, mm -hmm. but um, boy, I Thank forget you. where I was going with that. Um, oh, I remember what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> you know, April was, I've never been a fan of like the damsel in distress mm -hmm. kind of a Lois character. Lane. Oh, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. Because that's exactly <laughs> what I was going to uh, bring up. And, you know, Lois Lane being a great example, because she's, you know, a news reporter too. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, Lois always irritated me, especially in like the Superman cartoon, because she was almost arrogant about it. Like I will put myself in harm's apart, yeah. way. And then when she's there, she's very smug. Well, you know, who's coming to get me, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're <laughs> screwed, right? You know? And I just thought like, when is Superman going to be like, can you just stay home? Like I've got a <laughs> lot going on here. Never got that from April. I mean, you know, you did have the villains, you know, apprehend her and kidnap her from time to time, but it was never just like an eek help. It was her always, you know, one, voicing her mind, two, doing whatever she can to help the turtles get out of that situation. And uh, she was just a part of the team. You know, she wasn't there to, for them to have a reason to fight. She was get up, one give of up them. and wait. She would be part of the process till. To yeah, get she used her medium. You know, to uh, you know, be the eyes and the ears up on up top for the turtles who you know mm -hmm. couldn't obviously be up there. And uh, one of the episode clips I was just watching uh, today was, uh, I believe, the episode was called "April's Fool" or something like that, where Rebop, Bebop and April Rocks. April Fools. April yes. Fool. Uh, Bebop and Rack Study have her over her shoulder and they're carrying her away. And she jumps off uh, when the turtles bust in and does like this swing around and like clocks them in the face, like <laughs> kicks them like unconscious. And I'm like, this is why this character resonates so yeah. well. You know, you. Yeah. I think much, so much more than uh, Lois Lane. And I just hearing, you know, your construction of that character, it all, it all makes sense. It all fits together very well. Thank you. Well, that's the uh, that was the that was my intent. Um, a strong woman who uh, she was, like you said, she wasn't there to uh, be rescued. No. She got she got herself, you know, in 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 trouble once in a while. Mm -hmm. But it was always put me down, you big ape. It was oh, no. ah, rescue me, and it was always like cut out. You know, I'm here. I'm get, leave me alone already. Yeah, she, she was tough and. And what's interesting is that um, what we never really realized, and you know, here you guys are uh, adults gushing over the turtles. <laughs> and, um, we never really realized when we were recording how much of an impact it would be into the future. I've had a lot of um, young women come over to me for an autograph at a Comic-Con and tell me that uh, they were bullied. They were uh, the youngest of, you know, they had five brothers and that April O'Neil um, really got them out of trouble and gave them strength and gave them courage to pursue whatever their dreams were. A number of the women have been in the military. Um, oh, that's cool. That was their kind of their way out. And, and all of the guys too, you know, we hear it all the time. If not for the turtles, I don't know if I'd be alive or I don't know how I would have survived my childhood or, and of course, you know, thank God, many people have had wonderful childhoods and they're, the turtles are still part of their lives and it, they sure. didn't rest. They didn't need rescuing, but for those kids, um, and now adults, Turtles was a lifeline that nobody knew. Nobody had an idea it would be like that. And no. it's just, uh, it's great. And that, you know, you mentioned Lois Lane, you know, what are the other strong women in, especially in the eighties and cartoons, you know, or pre, you know, everybody was a strawberry shortcake or a My Pretty exactly. Pony or, uh, you know, Rose Petal Place or any of the other things. April was kind of the first professional strong woman and, Career woman, and yeah yeah it was how lucky am i <laughs> <laughs> how lucky are you and how lucky are we that uh, you voiced that character because uh, again uh, it's so funny you know like just the other day we were this is going to kind of go off track but it, it conveys my point the muppet show that's now on disney well, what's it called muppet now or something yes yeah kermit's voice is just mm -hmm. wrong that's <laughs> like, like why are you going to do it if you can't get kermit yeah. right but um, wow, that's weird 
I know. so many great voiceover, act- voiceover actors who can do Kermit. That's right. Strange. The one they chose, it sounds like he's been smoking a pack of Luckies for the past, you know, every day for the past year. Like it's really low and stuff. And I, I'm like, man, if you can't get Kermit, but you know, that's just goes to show that voice. Uh, the voice is so important mm-hmm. to uh, a character. I guess that's yeah. just what I'm getting at here. Uh, another thing I wanted to ask you, there's been so many interpretations of April over the years, uh, you know, J- Judith Hogue. I'm not sure the name of the act- actress who uh, portrayed her in the second and third movies, but then we have Megan Fox. We have all the other animated incarnations. And again, they, uh, for the most part, most of them seem to be strong uh, influence on that original character. What have been your interpretations of some of these uh, likenesses? You know, I'm just pleased that Turtles has continued and yeah. in whatever iteration, I-, I thought they've all been terrific, you know? They've, they've all um, embodied the characters. She's been strong. She has, um, she's stuck to her guns. Um, I, if not for them continuing the franchise, you know, I don't know if we'd still be as much in demand. Although I know fans of the show when they were growing up are just as in love, you know, with Turtles as they always have been. Sure. But I, I'm just pleased that it's continued. And I think all the women have done her right. They, I don't think that any one of them have uh, embarrassed April. Embarrassed maybe. the character, yeah. Embarrassed the character. I think they've all done a very nice job. Of course, I'm April and I'll always be April. And <laughs> There it is. <laughs> be April. But I don't look like some of them, so... But you are April. That's yes. that's that's the that's the difference. It's you and your personality as well as your voice that is that character. And it, man, again, it just shows through. It became the definitive April because I, you know, looking back at the comics, uh, I feel like she was much more like rough edge. And like I didn't like April in the original comic. It was again when the cartoon came along that this character was. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, the, the characters. <laughs> The characters in the original um, comic book were edgy Mm -hmm, and um, April was certainly more sexy. And um, they tried very hard over the years to bring us to this edgy, serious, dark place. And sometimes you'll see at the beginning of certain seasons um, the first few episodes are darker and there isn't the smart alecky banter. Um, but very shortly after those first few episodes, we start to be able to start throwing the sand around again. I don't know where it was coming from, but, you know, they'd sit us down and say, OK, this year we're going darker. And we'd like look at each other, <laughs> going, you know, isn't there enough darkness in the world? And, right. you know, the guys are so clever and so charming and so loving. It just it just wouldn't have, I don't think it would have been the turtles that everybody knows and loves if we had played it dark like right. Batman. Right. You know, I mean you had Batman. Who okay. You know, but turtles were were smart and and clever and they took all of the essence of all the classic comedy actors from Abbott and Costello and and uh, the Marx Brothers, and Burns and Allen, and you name it. These guys took the foundation of the of comedy and brought it into Turtles so that now you as adults can mm-hmm. watch it and you go, oh my gosh, is, I just got something different out of that line or what right. they were saying. I, right. I just realized that it, it, was, it was multi-layered. It wasn't just kid for kids. It was right. really... Mm-hmm. For now and now people are sharing it with their kids so it, it's generational it's incredible it is incredible and man i'm just i'm my own kid honestly i'm just a <laughs> big kid. i've got so many turtles well maybe i can turn the camera here so you can see all my turtles over here out of <laughs> out of shot i've got them everywhere i get they're everywhere that's just a few of them though they've made such an impact on my life as these guys know every time i say turtles they have to roll their eyes a little bit because i just <laughs> Talk no, about so they're fans. Much, but... They're big fans. <laughs> oh, they definitely are. They're, I, I just don't know if they're big fans of me after <laughs> I go on that rant. But imagine the writing if it was if they actually did go the darker route. You, I don't think you could use the guys that voiced them to go darker. Uh, the a Probably. lot of the things that are in those scripts were ad libs from the guys. Were they? That yeah. Sense. So so, and you know, thank God they let them do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
you know, and then the writers would also take cues from those characters and bring that bring that in too. And I, I think it was some of that improving that even like, wasn't it like help them break the fourth wall? Sometimes they would address that they were actually in an episode and stuff like that. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> that was so cool. Very cool. Kind of ahead of, of its time, actually, mm-hmm. when you think about it. But um, uh, there's a few other things I need to ask you about. Uh, one of which I heard you say on another interview, which really blew my mind. Um, growing up in the 80s, I was a huge fan and still have, I've got multiple of him. Teddy Ruxpin's around the house. Yeah, and um, that's so great. Where I had Teddy, my sister had Mother Goose. No! She did. <laughs> and I heard you say, and I don't remember if you said you were the voice of Mother Goose or just... No. Uh, no, you were like it wasn't the voices the voice in the stories. Mother Goose. I did other voices on the Mother Goose. Yes. Wasn't she beautiful? She's beautiful. She's oh cool. My, my sister still has her to this day. Is it yeah. still working? Oh, I can't say about if it's still working or not. I doubt it, but um, she still has it uh, for sure. Oh, um, that's so cool. That there was a you know there was a big market for Teddy Ruxpin and Mother Goose, and then from there I did um, a whole series of um, there was a stuffed animal and a book and a cassette tape, and um, it was called The Land of Pleasant Dreams. That was all that era as well. And oh my God, those were the most beautiful toys because you, I mean, they, they moved like Teddy and, and mother goose moved and, and it was beautiful. They were beautifully made toys. Absolutely. Probably took you back to your childhood a little bit playing with your toys. It did. It did. It did. I, I I actually now remembering um, even uh, there was a a doll called Chatty Kathy. I don't know if you know that. So this was a doll that had a button right here. And it obviously had some kind of recording device. So you would turn the button and you record something and then turn it off and then turn it the other way. And then she'd repeat what you'd say. Mm -hmm. So I had that toy. My grandfather was a toy liquidator. So um, he did lots of things like that, different kind of automotive liquidator. And and anyway, he would get all these toys. And Chatty Cathy was one of the toys he was, the store would go out of business and he would take the toys and sell them. So I used to have the uh, Beanie and Cecil. I don't know if you remember Beanie and Cecil. You're not old enough. So there was a cartoon about I know the name. Hanna-Barbera. Hanna Barbera, Beanie and Cecil. Beanie was a little boy who had a beanie with a propeller on the top, and Cecil was a serpent. And they had a string, and you would pull the string, and it would say, you know, I'm coming, Beanie Boy. <laughs> and, and so all of these talking things encouraged me to to copy that and to mimic, you know, come up with other ideas. Sure. That is so cool. It was so awesome to hear that because those toys were such big staples of both my sister and I's uh, growing up. Now, there's another thing I read online, and this is something that I, I've i learned not to trust the internet. And it was such a, it's, it's <laughs> such a crazy thing out there that I just, I have to ask you about. Uh, I read that you are the uncredited voice of Baby Glenn in Bride of Chucky. Is yes. that right? <laughs> Yes. That is so amazing. I am the biggest Child's Play fan. I love oh all this Oh my films. God, that's so funny. That's so funny. Yeah. I uh, Yes. They. I came in and did babies, you know, ba- a baby screaming and crying. And then they mixed it with a pig squeal. And oh my that's, God. And that's baby Glenn. Okay. I might have, I'm going to cut in. I'm going to cut in really quick a clip of that audio because I listened to it right before we started this, and I thought, how? How is she doing that without ripping her vocal cords out? <laughs> I think maybe that was the pig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. I did. That was before I knew about the pig. That is cool. I mean, I'm glad it's true because I'm like, man, this is probably one of those things they're going to be like, where did you read that? You know? <laughs> yeah. That's... I think I've only mentioned that on in in one interview. 
in, in all the interviews I've done. So you really looked for uh, esoteric things. <laughs> well, it's April O'Neil. I'm not going to go in half cocked on this one. But um, it's just, it's funny, you know, to find that out about Child's Play, you know, The Bride of Chucky, being such a fan of that, to hear about Mother Goose. And then, of course, April O'Neil. It's so incredible how a person's voice can, you know, uh, kind of echo through the halls of your house for years, inspire you and mm -hmm. not even know Every really spectrum there is not even know like <laughs> that the voice coming from April is also the voice coming from the, you know, the other side of the house from that talking goose and also from that screaming uh, hell spawn coming out of that doll, you know, like you never know. Like, it's so cool. I just, the industry is amazing. Did you guys have any? It other? is. Um, I have a nine-year-old son and he was really into the Nickelodeon, the newer Nickelodeon turtle series. And we were watching it one day and April's mom comes on and starts talking. I'm like, that is the original April O'Neil. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. That was cool. What was yeah, it like? You know, the guys did some crossovers. You know, they mm -hmm. had, you know, the our show met their show. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, um, Rob Paulson did Raphael on our show and Donatello on the Nickelodeon show. Mm -hmm. So he got to talk to himself. <laughs> uh, well, not really. So, yeah, it was oh, it was great. I got a call from Nickelodeon. We'd like you to come in. Part of like, hey, yeah. I'm thinking, hmm, what's this? So, yeah, I got to play April O'Neil's mom, Mrs. O'Neil. And unfortunately, she was a bot and um, not real. That would have been cool. Back, you know, I did it for the storyline because they were, I guess they were always looking for her. Yeah, so it was fun. It was really fun. I it was a joy to do that. That was such a good series. Yes, yeah. it, it really was. I uh, I was really apprehensive at first because I'm such a huge original Turtles fan, and my son was watching. I'm like, yeah, okay. And then yeah, it, it redeemed itself very quickly. <laughs> yeah. So what was interesting about that? So you know that when we recorded, we all recorded together. Okay. So um, we'd sit in the studio with our scripts and the microphone. We'd rehearse it, take a break, and then we'd record it. And that's kind of how that banter and those relationships developed. It's exactly how they developed because they were there next to each other, talking to each other and working those characters out. So the Nickelodeon experience was completely different. Tiny little booth, producers and director on the other side of the glass by yourself and just doing line by line. And I went in at least four times. The first time was to lay down the original with no animation. Second time were line drawings and then they wanted changes or said differently. Mm -hmm. um, third time was more animation. And then the last time it was done, the animation was done and they wanted, you know, something else for the storyline. Never got to be in the studio with any of the actors. So, wow. you know, that, that changes the dynamic. Um, and maybe because the turtles were already established that okay. each of those actors who'd already been exposed to the Ninja Turtles could embody the turtle in their, with their interpretation. Mm. Um, but our show, and I don't know if the turtles would have even continued and lasted had we not been together and developed this family and the relationships between the characters if we would just been there by ourselves i don't know i don't i yeah. don't know because the ad-libbing is what really then they then the writers would take that those personalities and run with it and it was the guys that really did that and you're talking about that kind of family atmosphere that developed i've seen um recent uh, like facebook videos and stuff of all you guys getting together to do like a uh, christmas like uh carol and stuff like mm. that that's it's just yeah. so cool that after all these years you guys are still you know collaborating and hanging out as a family unit because of comic cons and us getting together again as a team and it's been real joy to do those unfortunately with covid we can't do them at, do them right now right. i know we would have done a new christmas song we would have done something new for thanksgiving <laughs> so it's fun. Cam's got this beautiful house and uh, easily set up as a studio. And every one of us, we all sing. You know, we all come from music <laughs> backgrounds, which is incredible. So it's fun. That's fun. And uh, Peter Renaday has a beautiful whistle. He's, boy, did you hear him on, uh, I think we did um, Harvest Moon for last, uh, maybe a year ago or longer. We did a... Um, our first one was 
uh, shine on harvest moon for the for Thanksgiving, and okay. Peter did this beautiful whistling. Um, so anyway, check I'm it out. Have to look for that. Yeah, yeah. I have to check that out. <laughs> I saw the Christmas one. I think you guys did last year. Perhaps? We did. I, I'm dreaming of a of a green Christmas. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think we've done a few. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, Ken? Nope. Well, Ray, no. I... <laughs> <laughs> Jack. <laughs> no questions from Jack. No, I've had some uh, comments here and there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this is about how it typically goes. I'm not really a mic hog, I promise. It's just, that's just my contribution to the show. <laughs> um, but no, it's been a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I can't tell you what a thrill it is to be talking uh, with April and Neil. It's, thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, thank you. I've had a wonderful time. You guys are terrific. And if it's okay with you, I'll close the show. Oh my all right? yes, please do <laughs> please do this is april o'neill with a special report here with jeremy jack and randy at canned air podcast everyone listen in this is april o'neill channel six news <laughs> that was amazing thank you so much <laughs> oh, oh, my that was such thank a you for being on my face tonight <laughs> Thank you for your gift of scholarship. That was very kind. Absolutely. And um, just be safe. And I hope that we'll all be together. What city are you guys in? We're in central Ohio, Columbus area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I want to come out and visit. So find me a Comic-Con. We'll come Ooh, out. We'll you know? Do. Yeah, absolutely. All you have to do is pitch it. Tell them you want the turtles. You want April. We'll be, as soon as this damn virus thing is over, right, we'll be yeah. here. We'll be there. We'd love, and we could do a live. You know, we can do a podcast with all of us. That would be amazing. That would be <laughs> so freaking fun! Oh my lord, that would be amazing. We could we could yeah. uh, try to read scripts. And us do our best turtle and interpret. I'm running. I'm getting <laughs> no, to right. it. Ahead of myself. <laughs> you're, Brief, Jeremy. Your turtle, your, tur your turtletation, your turtletation. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Renee, seriously, thank you so much. And if there's anything we can ever do to help you or any of the other cast members out don't hesitate to ask oh thank you just get us to ohio to sign photographs yes ma'am oh, that'd be awesome <laughs> we'll be first in line if yep. so yes <laughs> will do all right guys all right. be safe happy new year happy merry christmas and thanksgiving and uh yes. we'll get through it <laughs> yes ma'am <laughs> thank you so much thank, Renee. thank you so yeah, much thanks. be safe bye bye, -bye. All right, everyone, and there was our interview once again with Renee Jacobs. How much fun was she? That has got to be like one of my top uh, interviews I've ever been a part of on this show. I mean, she was amazing. I would have to agree, Randy. I mean, uh, everything about that deliver. I mean, you know, sometimes when you do these kind of shows and you're talking to somebody that, you know, has had influence on your life, you you're always afraid that... Man, I hope this person is cool. Someone lives up to it. Yeah, your and hype. not that I ever feared she wouldn't be, but mm -hmm. holy cow. I mean, not only were expectations met, but beyond. What yeah. an awesome person. <laughs> it, it's kind of fitting that it was a Thanksgiving episode because she really felt like family there at the end. Yeah, and very, just yeah. very giving. Yeah. Just very giving. But uh, Renee, I want to thank you once again for being on the show. And Jack, what have we on the website, sir? Go to candairpodcast.com where you can see show highlights, guest info, listen to the show, follow us on all our social social media become a patron buy some merch see some of our youtube videos and if you'd like to be a guest and promote your work send us an email on our contacts page there it is and we're also on twitter at canned air pod and instagram at canned underscore air and again the website jack was telling you about access to our patreon page to our merch page everything that you need canned air related in one nice package. That's it. There you go. So I think that's going to do it uh, for this week's episode. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy, Happy Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving to you guys. Yes, yeah. thank you. And until next time, I'm Jeremy Colley. I'm Jack Doherty. And I'm Randy Hardenbrook. Thanks so much for listening, everyone, and be excellent to each other. Hey, what are you doing out here? I thought you were grounded. My parents are mean, so I'm running away from home. Where you gotta go? I don't know yet, but that'll show them. <laughs> it sure will. Shipwreck! Parents just don't understand, and it gets lonely on the road, so be sure to listen to the Candare podcast. Now we know. And knowing is half the battle. G.I. Joe!
This has been a Canned Air production. 